Hello and welcome to Worship Online with Upper Clyde Parish Church, UCPC. It's good to be able to join together, whether gathered or scattered, and to worship the one who is ever faithful and ever with us. Before we begin our service, there are a couple of church notices. The first is to say a huge big thank you to Heather Watt and to Ursula Bailey. They were conducting worship in the church building for us last Sunday while I took some time off on annual leave. So hugely appreciate that. Thank you to both of you. Uh, Wednesday this week, the Guild is meeting at 2 p.m. in the church building and there'll be a guest speaker. It will be the Reverend Tim Tunley from the Seafarers Society. So come along and uh, hear what Tim has to say about what he does and also for a time of fellowship after that in the church hall over a cup of tea. Looking further ahead at our Harvest Thanksgiving service, this is going to be held in the church building on October the 24th, so just a couple of weeks to go. And for those of you who decorate the building on the Saturday before, just to say that the church will be open between 1.30 and 3.30 on the Saturday for you to go and do all the wonderful decorating that you do. I mean, we have a pretty church and it's just made even prettier by the wonderful decorations for harvest. So thank you in advance for decorating the building. Um, but 1.30 to 3.30 on the Saturday for the harvest service in the building on the 24th. On that Sunday as well in the building, we are going to be having a trial run of doing communion in a more COVID compliant way. So what better day than to reintroduce communion than our Thanksgiving Harvest Thanksgiving service. So communion will also be held. We're also going to be having some visitors, pilgrims who are walking from London through to Glasgow for the COP26 conference and they're making their way through our parish on that weekend which is why our harvest service has been pushed back a couple of weeks and I'm hoping that one of the representatives might say a few words on why they're doing what they're doing. So a busy service, a full service in the building. But for those of you who won't be able to make it in person, we will have an online version of a harvest service available as well. So that's, I think, all of our notices. Goodness me, it is. So uh, let's take a moment of quiet now as we prepare our hearts, our souls, our whole selves to meet with God in this time of worship. Let's be still. Our call to worship. Come before God, you faithful people, whether happy or sad, confident or scared, strong or weak, content or frazzled. God is listening. Come to God no matter your life's experience, your poise or predicament, preference or pattern. God is listening. Bring your hallelujahs and your complaints, your praise and your laments, for God wants you as you are. In such intimacy, let us come before God and hold back no prayer or emotion of our heart. So God, we come before you and we offer you our worship. And our opening hymn of praise is the King of Love, my shepherd is.
Let's come before God in prayer, offering to God our praise and giving to God our regrets. Let us pray. Glory be to you, God, our strength and our redeemer, our light in every darkness, our source and our care. We join this day, certain and uncertain, in awe of your undying love given to us and to all. We come to offer our praise for all that you give and all that you do. Glory be to you, God, our strength and our Redeemer. Look on us, your children, with care. Pour out your compassion on we who are conscious of our failings, of our inability to always live up to what you desire of us. Help us to know that through your grace we are forever forgiven free to live lives bathed in your love. Glory be to you, God, our strength and our Redeemer, in this age of forced isolation and chosen individualism, guide us away from empty rhetoric and lead us forever in eagerness towards service of your people and the work of your kingdom. Glory be to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer, our light and our source. Be with us this day as we dedicate ourselves once more to seeking you, to asking questions, to accepting doubt, and to working ever to live and to share your love this day and every day. We pray in Jesus' name, who taught his friends when praying to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all people of the East. His sons used to go and hold feasts in one another's houses in turn, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the feast days had run their course, Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This is what Job always did. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. 
the Lord said to Satan, very well, all that he has is in your power. Only do not stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day, when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell on them and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels and carried them off, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came across the desert, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people. And they're dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin. All that people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job 
from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the things that I really love about this job, and something that I've missed because of the COVID restrictions, 
is being a school chaplain at our five wee primary schools. The, the staff and the students, they're great, they're so good, and I'm always impressed with the really good, lovely atmosphere that each of our schools has managed to build, and all of them are fun, creative learning environments. Well, I had a great time at school when I was there. It looked and sounded quite a lot different. I mean, we sat in rows. There were no smart boards. There was no digital technology. But, you know, one thing that seems to have stood the test of time, one thing that seems not to have got old, is that from P1 through to P7, the children love when they're rewarded for good work or good behaviour with stickers. And over the time I've been here, I've really enjoyed being the occasional sticker dispenser at school assemblies, giving out stickers for everything from most improved handwriting to listening well to being kind. If I'm good, do I get a sticker? Now, back in the day, this was very much the mindset among the people of God, a simplified way of breaking down the code of law that God had given to Moses and which over time had expanded into a great tranche of rules to live by. It was a, a blessings and woes understanding of life. Now, on the blessing side of the equation was the thought, if I'm good, I'll be rewarded. God will bless me. Basically, if I'm good, I'll get a sticker. And this blessing was understood in terms of wealth, good health, the number of children, all very tangible signs of prospering. But, but on the woes side of the equation was the thought, and if I'm bad, I'll be punished. God will curse me. And this was understood in terms of not thriving, of living in poverty, having an illness, for women being unmarried or widowed, and if married, unable to have children. All sorts of hardships were believed to have been signs of God's displeasure at the poor behaviour of particular folk. Definitely no stickers for them, just a great big stick. Now it's interesting how this view has persisted down through the centuries. Our own John Knox was very much into that kind of theology. And even now, there are some folk who still either consciously or subconsciously buy into this understanding of God, and of how to live as God's people. I mean, I remember my own gran often saying, after something bad had happened, God plays funny tricks, ain't it? And there are folk I've spoken with over the years who've been known to say about them coming to church that if they did, the roof would probably fall down. This is a worldview that's very much focused on the God who smites and focused less on the God who is smitten with us, the God who loves us. And the cartoonist Gary Larson was onto something, I think, when he drew this particular cartoon. If I'm good, do I get a sticker? At the beginning of Job's story, we see a man who seems to have lots and lots of stickers. We're told that Job has seven sons and three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants. And I'm sure he's also got five gold rings and a partridge in a pear tree somewhere in all that mix. So prosperous is he that he's considered the greatest of all the people of the East, according to the book of Job. And we're told that he's super duper faithful. Job is the man who has it all. Job is blessed to the max. He's clearly been a very good boy. But the thing about the book of Job is that it runs completely counter to that if I'm good, I get stickers, if I'm bad, I get the stick mentality. Because through no fault of his own, Job suffers unbelievable catastrophic loss. Now, first things first, the book of Job is written in the style of an extended parable. So it begins, there was once a man, you know, in the very similar style of the way that Jesus would begin one of his stories. 
and nobody's really sure where the land of Oz happened to be. It's a story that's intended to teach, but what's it about? Well, the book of Job is a story that explores what happens when bad things happen to good people. It's an attempt to discuss the age-old question for people of faith, how to speak of God in the midst of suffering, and in this case, undeserved suffering. And as the story unfolds, so it dismisses the idea that if you're just good enough, if you just do all the right things, that life will just be peachy. Job is the guy who does all the right things. Job is the guy who is righteous and good. And Job is the guy who loses everything. The book of Job is one long wrestling match about a guy with his God. In it are well-meaning friends who buy into this philosophy, but you must have done something to deserve all of this. And a wife who questions his clinging on to the faith and who tells him just to curse God and die. But Job hasn't done anything wrong and Job doesn't curse God even though he may be a bit snippy in responding to his wife and his friends. Job's first instinct is to worship, to acknowledge that no matter what circumstance he finds himself in, and, and here it's deep grief and lament, that even so, blessed be the name of the Lord. In this hardest of all hard times, Job responds to the loss of all he holds dear, by praising the one who gave him those gifts. And stripped of all that gave his life meaning, Job clings to the God who gave him life in the first place. But this is not a story about passive acceptance. For all that Job acknowledges and clings to God, over a, considerable, over a considerable number of chapters in the book, Job spends quite a lot of time questioning and challenging God. Why, God? What's the deal, God? Don't you care, God? What's the point of you anyway? These are universal questions, questions asked through millennia by people of faith. These are the questions we ask when bad things happen in our own lives, or in the lives of those we care about, or in the lives of those we've never met, but find ourselves moved when we see their suffering in the news. Why, God? What's the deal, God? Don't you care, God? And what's the point of you anyway? And to ask those questions is not a sign of doubt. To ask demonstrates a grown-up faith, a faith in a God who's big enough to take such hard questions, a God big enough to hear our cry of lament as well as our cry of praise, a God big enough to cling to in the pain and the mess and the brokenness and the sadness of it all, even when we don't understand. Job's response travels through the centuries and we find another cry of lament from the cross. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And in it, we see the pain and anguish and sorrow that even God experienced and find that like Jesus, we are not abandoned. Emmanuel, God is with us. And in the rawness, in the hard reality, in the questions, we find an integrity and what it is to be in a mature relationship with God, not just playing in the shallows and hoping we might get a sticker. Job invites us to look God in the eye, to ask those big questions of faith that keep us awake in the dark reaches of the night. And as we do, to discover the good news that God can handle all of it. For our God is a big enough God. Amen. Let's take some time now to reflect on God's word heard and preached and on our big enough God as we listen to a song called Be Still My Soul and 
No, it's not the hymn of the same name. So let's be still. Let's still our souls and let us be. Be still, my soul, for the longing that you have is found. That you hold inside Lord, I open up my hand Your glory meets me where I am I want to know the depths of this great love That gives me life and makes me Take joy, my heart, because I know that I'm made stronger when this life gets hard. We come before God in prayer once more. We dedicate our offering, we give our thanks, and we offer to God our concerns. So let us pray. Gracious God, all our possessions are worthless unless dedicated to you. All our belongings are of no value if owned with thankless hearts. So we offer back to you what was always yours, asking for your blessing. Blessed be your name, O Lord, forever. God of transparent light and blinding darkness, God of absence and of presence, of simple clarity and tangled mystery, we are grateful that we can be open and honest with you in our prayers. No more than that, we owe it to you to be as real as we can about our hopes and our fears, our questions and our concerns. We give you thanks that no matter what is going on in our lives, that you are ever with us, cheering us on, consoling us, caring for our needs. 
thank you for your great faithfulness, for your love and time and patience and energy. Thank you for the many blessings you have given us, for friends, family, good neighbours, for showing up in Jesus to show us the way of love. In love, we think of our world and those in it offering our prayers. As we remember Job's story, so we pray for those who experience loss through theft, who find their homes ransacked, their livelihoods taken away, and things of worth and sentimental value disregarded for pence and pound. We pray for those who experience loss of home through repossession, rejection, or choice, those who have no place to call their own, no safety or security. We pray for those who experience loss through the ravages of the elements caused by natural disasters, avoidable catastrophes, and those deliberately inflicted. We pray for those who experience loss as a result of armed conflict with its far-reaching impact on communities, nations, and generations. We pray for those who experience loss through ill health, for those who experience loss of life, who stand prematurely at graves, and those who have had time to say their goodbyes but still miss loved ones. In a time of quiet prayer, we bring before you all who are on our minds and in our hearts this time, and we bring our own prayer concerns before you. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We offer you these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.
And as we bring this time of worship to a close, so we finish with a blessing. Go out into the world in peace. Hold fast to what is good and right and true. Rejoice in the wonders of God's presence all around us. Return no one evil for evil, but love as you have been loved. Dare to walk with the broken, the hurting, the grieving and the vulnerable, for that is where God walks as well. Go out into the world in peace and may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. And so our time of worship is at an end. May you know God's presence with you this coming week. And until next time, take care, God bless, and goodbye for now.